Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks Westland. Okay. Um, Can we wait I'm like also gonna 20 pin. seconds for people to come in? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to pin us, if that's cool. Yeah, sounds good. everyone. So uh, while we wait for everyone to get into their own breakout rooms, um, do you guys just want to drop in the chat what you're most excited for about UCLA? Or, I don't know, have you guys already <laughs> food? I knew you'd heard, I knew you'd heard that one. Yeah. Um, has the deadline to submit your, your is it SIR, your acceptance already passed? Or when is that? It's like May, right? Yeah, May 1st. Okay. But yeah, I think the food was a big deciding factor for me to come to UCLA. The dining halls are <sighs> chef's kiss. I miss them. Yeah. Which which dining hall is your favorite lesson? Covell. Covell? Yeah. I, I like B plate the best. <laughs> B plate's too healthy. <laughs> I love my pasta. I used to eat so much Ronde. Oh, me the too. Burritos, the nachos. Mm -hmm. I miss it. That, that was a big part of my freshman 15. <laughs> Just Ronde. Because the burritos and the bowls, you know, they're huge. Yeah. Freshman 15 is definitely real at UCLA, mm -hmm. guys. Mm -hmm. All right. I think uh, people have begun to settle in. So, yeah, thank you guys so much for coming out and joining our breakout room. I guess if any of you guys have any questions, you can feel free to speak up or drop in the chat, whatever works better. So I remember that Caden asked earlier in the earlier session, um, we just didn't have a chance to answer his question. He was asking how we find our niches or our specializations. So I guess I can go first. Um, I'm not gonna lie. I don't 100% know I what I wanna do. Um, currently I'm planning on working with Northrop Grubbin after I graduate. So obviously I'm going into aerospace, but when I came into UCLA, I was interested in, and I still am interested in battery development and research and uh, renewable energy. So like I said earlier, I interned with an electric vehicle company during my first internship. And so that gave me a bit of exposure, except I was on the mechanical chassis team. So I wasn't working directly with anything battery related, um, but it was cool to also get to talk to the electrical team at that company and see what they were doing. Um, but I also realized then that I just don't think I want to pigeonhole myself into, into renewable energy yet. I feel like there's a lot more developments coming that I still need to learn about. And so one of my plans is to eventually get a master's degree, hopefully in power engineering, because eventually I think I do want to go into renewable energy. So I hope Duong, this is also uh, helping me answer your question. So I guess my personal interest in renewable energy is something that helped me find my niche. So I did my tech breath in the renewable energy tech breath or it's energy in the environment. So I took classes in the mechanical engineering department and uh, some other departments that offered some courses on climate change. Um, the mechanical engineering department had a class on energy and the environment. And then you also have to take like thermodynamics and stuff to learn about heat and energy transfer. So also student groups help you find your niche. Um, I also thought I was really interested in circuits until I started doing some projects. And I was like, I don't really know if this is for me because everything's really tiny. And I kind of like seeing things on the bigger scale. So I, I dispute a lot, but that's my spiel. Yeah, I think another thing to note is that um, as an undergrad EE, your first year is gonna look like pretty much the same, no matter like what specialization you take. Like it's gonna be a lot of physics, a lot of math probably, um, a couple of CS classes. And basically after your first year, you can like use those experiences to decide what you're interested in. Um, the, the three like ECE majors, like CS, E, C, E, and ECE, or and EE, all share like pretty similar prerequisites. So what a lot of people actually end up doing is uh, they'll come in as EEs for their first year, and then during their second year, they'll decide like whether they want to stay or switch. And that's what I did. So I ended up 
liking like the CS side of things a little bit more, which is why I'm a CSC now. Um, I know a lot of other friends that have done similar things with like CE. So yeah, the nice thing about E at UCLA is it's pretty flexible with that. Wesleyan, I think you have a question about uh, the battery and renewables thing. Yeah, um, I'll expand a little bit more on that. So when I first came to UCLA, not actually when I was admitted, but I hadn't accepted yet. Um, I was deciding between Berkeley with energy engineering or UCLA with electrical engineering. I decided to go with UCLA because I saw the campus and went, oh my God, it's so pretty over here. Plus I'm Southern California born and raised. So I'm kind of biased to staying down here. Plus the campus is, oh, it's gorgeous. Um, but I found out that for battery development, which at the time is something I thought I really wanted to do, even though I have, I have no engineering background. My parents aren't in engineering at all. Um, I'd never seen a circuit. Uh, I'd never touched any coding stuff, just absolutely zero experience. But I thought I wanted to go into battery development and research. So uh, it turns out that's more of the materials science major. Um, and admittedly, more of the energy classes are in the mechanical engineering department. However, you learn a lot of fundamental basics about energy and transfer of energy and power and stuff in electrical engineering. It's just not what I expected. Um, so, but the reason why I still decided to stay with EE instead of transferring to mechanical engineering is because I feel like EE is just more broad. Um, and plus, I think it, if, if you want to work in power and renewable energy, I think you think elect, electricity and stuff. So it might just be easier to stay with electrical engineering instead of going into mechanical engineering, because I think there's this more on the big scale hardware kind of things. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, <laughs> but I think you could do literally anything with electrical engineering. I know a lot of utility companies that have like rotation programs for electrical engineers when they first start working. And so they place you into different teams and you get to go around and try out different branches of those utility companies um, in regard to their power and energy stuff. So for example, one of them is San Diego Gas and Electric. They have a rotation program for electrical engineers. All right, I see the question. Does any of the student orgs here use CAD for projects or events? Um, at least for IEEE, we have a workshop. We have workshops every quarter. And one of the most successful ones has been like our 3D printing workshops. So we do offer that, um, but it's not really like a mainstay. Uh, it's not one of the main focuses of our projects. I know ASME does some, does a lot of CAD work. Uh, that's the Mechanical Engineering Club. So if you're really interested in that, you could also look there. We've had people participate in both IEEE and ASME at the same time. So definitely a possibility. Uh, not sure about you guys. Do you guys have any CAD stuff? I don't personally have CAD stuff. I have a 3D printer and I bought, I bought it to purposely force myself to learn CAD because it's something I want to learn. Um, it's going very slowly because I have, uh, I'm trying to find motivation. You know, everything on, being on Zoom, it's just kind of hard to want to push yourself to do anything. But there is a class on CAD under the mechanical engineering department. But I think during your second pass, anyone's allowed to enroll in it. It's called MAE 94. Um, they have it every quarter. I've heard it's really good to get a base learning for it. Yeah, um, HKN doesn't do much with CAD, but if you are really interested, I recommend like checking out the Makerspace and also Creative Labs because they do a lot of stuff with CAD. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right, next question is, do you think we would be able to come to campus in the fall of 2021? How would the projects work in remote education? Oh, wasn't there like a, a guide for <laughs> what to respond to this question with? So they didn't send us a guide, but they did say that they have plans to be in person. Um, I think they said something like their current plan is if the class has more than 60 people enrolled, then it will be online. But if it's less than 60 people, right. then it will be in person or they might try and stagger students into different lectures. Uh, it, it's not 100% clear yet because, you know, vaccine rollout right now is 
it's hard to predict the future. You know, it's becoming much more available to people, but that's only in specific areas in other countries. I don't really know what the situation is in. Yeah, um, at least for like the remote projects thing. So this year, obviously everything is online, COVID. Um, and we did all our projects remotely. So that involved like getting signups and then shipping out parts, doing like online lectures. Uh, we use like our Discord server to, you know, do like uh, like team meetings and then checkoffs and stuff. Um, so no matter what like next year ends up looking like, I'm 99% sure that at least we are committed to like making sure everybody can participate in our projects, no matter if you're, you know, at home or you're on campus. Hoping that most of you guys are able to be on campus for the experience, but um, yeah, I, I guess we'll just have to wait and see, but don't worry, we're going to try to include everybody. Next yeah. question? Or, oh next wait, question. Cody, go ahead. No, 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 go on to the next question. Okay. <laughs> Is it easy to join clubs, especially more sought after ones? Well, for what I can tell you, we it's open to anyone. You don't have to apply. Um, I think that also answers uh, another question later on. But yeah, for, for our events, it's just show up and you can go. Um, you can be part of it. But for our longer term projects, we do take applications. Um, but we try and keep as many people as we can. We try and buy a lot of parts to accommodate everyone that we can. Yeah, same thing here. Um... The definition of being a member of IEEE is very loose. It can just mean like, you know, coming to our lab or coming to any social. Uh, there's no like formal process or fees or anything like that. Uh, there are project applications at the start of the year since they're like a year long curriculum type thing. Um, so we take applications for that. But the purpose for that, it really is just to make sure that we have enough resources to accommodate everyone more than, you know, like making it prestigious or anything. So we do try to take uh, everybody that we can. And in past years, we've taken like 100% of applicants. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, for HKN, like you're welcome to come to any of our events, even if you aren't part of HKN. But um, unfortunately, we do have to be a bit more selective uh, of a club because we are an honor society. Um, so we can we um, can only induct like the top uh, like third of the uh, senior class and top fourth of the junior class, um, which I guess that also answers the next question. Um, could y'all elaborate on the fast track program, HKN and perhaps UPE? Um, UPE works similarly to HKN in that they only induct like the top third of um, like the uh, junior CS or senior CS students and the top fourth of the whatever. Um, it's like similar criteria. Um, fast track, it's like you kind of get admitted into it. Um, and like what that is, it's like, during the summer, you basically do like a research with one of the faculty and it's like guaranteed. Um, I'm not part of Fast Track and I don't know if Wes and Brian are, but you don't have to be part of Fast Track to have a successful and fun um, UCLA engineering experience. So, or, or, or even be part of HKN, so yeah. Yeah, I wanted to elaborate one more thing on the clubs, uh, on how easy it is to join clubs. So we can only speak on our three clubs here. Um, there are other big clubs like Bruin Racing and that one I'm pretty sure is selective. Uh, I think the, the clubs that are very focused on it, one big project are more selective with their application process, but generally most of the clubs at UCLA are just kind of like show up and you're a member. You know, they're willing to have anyone and everyone that is interested in participating. Um, okay, so Another question. Uh, more generally, are there any big pieces of advice you have for all of us going into the ECE program? Be open to learning. Uh, manage your time well. It will admittedly be difficult at times. Some of the courses are particularly rough, but I think that's how I made a lot of friends. Also, most of my friends are from Watt, but we would work together on class homework um, and struggle together. And so that's how you form some really strong bonds here. But I think also just being open to learning anything. Um, if you go in with the mindset of, oh, I don't really care about this. And admittedly, this is how I thought a lot about my classes when I first started at UCLA. I would think, oh, I don't really care about this because I only want to go into renewable energy. Um, I admittedly didn't do very well in those classes. 
and that is on me for not being willing to really learn it. So just be open to learning anything. Yeah, I have some tips too, and they're going to be pretty different from Westland's. Um, my first one is to use bruinwalk.com. I'll link it below. It's like rate my professor. Uh, but you basically get to see like some past reviews for professors, as well as like great distributions. That's really helpful for picking classes, uh, picking GEs. That's really nice. Um, another one would be to use your test banks. Test banks are your best friend. I'm sure Cody can tell you a little bit about that one. Um, but yeah, a lot of times student organizations will hold like past or midterms and finals from your classes. And that can be really helpful for studying. Um, and next one is just, uh, you know, try to have some friends in your classes and study partners, people to, you know, vent about, discuss things about. And yeah, your, your freshman year is pretty nice in that um, uh, you have a lot of friends and a lot of people in your classes. And then it's the time to just like meet new people and uh, try to enjoy yourself too much. Don't, you know, uh, spend all day studying, locked up in your dorm, try to experience life. So yeah, that's my tips for you guys. Yeah, um, to build off of Brian's point about the test bank, it is pretty useful. Um, HKN has one, um, and if you join, you get access to a test bank. But even if you aren't HKN, you just ask a friend that's like an HKN to just grab a test for you. Uh, that's what a lot of people do. <laughs> um, yeah, and then about Brunwalk, there's a lot of very juicy uh, reviews on there. <laughs> I, I sometimes read it for fun, but yeah. Oh yeah, don't get 19p. It's too many swipes. <laughs> you know, you know, go ahead. We will take your extra swipes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please please get 19p so so Brian and I can uh just just uh you know <laughs> mute off with you guys. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh next question was can anyone join IEEE or what? Or is there an application process? I think we covered that one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Can you take courses across majors or schools oh like I don't know, i'm pretty sure you can right like you can you can just take any class unless there's like a like a restriction yeah i think you can also do that with your tech breath i, I guess it depends um if you're just asking to take classes for the fun of it and not to fulfill any requirements so generally for that you will have to check and make sure that there aren't any restrictions but for example for my tech breath i took classes in mechanical engineering and uh, in the atmospheric and oceanic sciences department. And that one is not under the engineering department. I'm pretty sure it's under the College of Letters and Science, but also GEs are going to be in other departments and schools. So yeah, you, you can. I think generally on your second pass is when they release the restrictions so that anyone can take a course, but there, I have seen a couple courses where they don't remove that restriction. That's very rare. All right, next question is what events slash organizations did you guys attend or join outside your major? Um, so my first year, I, in addition to doing IEEE, I was also a part of ACA, which is like Association of Chinese Americans. Um, basically, you just get like sworn to a family and then you can meet some like other people. Um, so that was pretty fun. Um, I was also like a really big music nerd in high school. Like I played clarinet, I did like marching band, orchestra, all that stuff. Uh, so during my freshman year, I auditioned for like the UCLA like wind ensemble as well as the orchestra. So I spent two quarters playing in there. Um, so yeah, I think a, 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 lot, a lot of the time people worry about like the time commitment um, and like balancing that alongside of school. Um, and I think that uh, eventually you will like find time to do the things that you really want to do um, and like cut out all the extra stuff. Um, but don't be afraid to like join a lot of different things your first quarter and try to get a feel for what you like. Yeah, for sure. Um, and for me, I'm part of a Asian American Christian fellowship. Um, so yeah, if, if like, you know, you're, you're, you're religious or you wanna stay true to your roots, you know, feel free to do so. I think it's, it's um, encouraged to uh, just, you know, Stay, stay, stay true to who you are at UCLA. I am admittedly not part of any other events or, or, or organizations outside of uh, what's in the electrical engineering department. Or I was in another club that was engineering related, but it wasn't under any specific 
uh, department and doesn't exist anymore. So I can't give good advice for that. I'm really sorry. Is it possible or recommended to graduate in under four years? Uh, you definitely can. It is really hard because you would have to be taking four or five classes a quarter. And generally I would not recommend taking more than four. And even with four, I would recommend taking like three of your major or core classes plus a GE to kind of balance it. Um, it can be a lot of work, but I do know people that graduate one or two quarters early because they take summer courses, but that also means that they generally don't have internship experience because they're trying to do almost a full course load during the summer, which doesn't leave them time or room for an internship or research experience. So I wouldn't recommend it. Um, plus your senior year is supposed to be your most fun year. And it's generally the time where uh, assuming that you planned your classes well, you should have most of your GEs during your senior year. So it's more of a relaxed year and then you can take more time to enjoy yourself and enjoy campus and really appreciate the last four years before you either go to grad school or go into industry or do something else, you know? Yeah, I have some friends at some other like UCs who uh, like their engineering programs are pretty sparse and they can get away with like graduating in three years. but. UCLA is not one of those schools. There's a lot of classes you gotta take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only way you're graduating four years at UCLA is like if you come in with like all of your lower div physics done and all of your lower div math done. And I have one friend that came in like that and he's graduating in three years, but like that's the only person I know that's graduating in three years, so yeah. Uh, the next question is, uh, were the lectures synchronous or asynchronous for the past year? Um, they're all synchronous. Um, we all have our shared experience of ditching class and just watching the video lecture. Yeah, I had some that were as asynchronous, but it's very rare. Most of my classes are synchronous, but you know, they're recorded so you can watch it later. I personally try and go to class when it's scheduled. Otherwise, I have no schedule or control over my life um, and will just never watch the recordings. But it depends on the, pro the professor, I think. Most of them, I think, just want to go synchronous because it's easier to uh, schedule and manage. But I do know a couple that were asynchronous. Like, for example, one of mine um, was asynchronous because they it was it had two professors and both of them worked normally, you know, full time jobs, um, and then decided that asynchronous was just easier for them. Yeah, um, building off of that, I think another distinction is like whether being present synchronously is mandatory. Um, I think the most common case is like, there will be some time slot where they give the live lecture and then they'll post the recording later. Um, I've also had like my share of classes where particip participation is mandatory. So if you need to show up like during that spe specific time slot and then ones where like you don't. So it just depends on the professor. How is breeding at UCLA? I think it varies from major to major. For EC specifically, uh, it also kind of varies from class to class, but I think generally the lower division classes are graded, I'd say a bit harsher than the upper divisions. The upper divisions tend to be graded better so you're not so stressed out, um, but that's also because the lower division classes tend to be a lot bigger. And so they can only give so many like A's and B's. Yeah, I wouldn't say there's like grade inflation or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it depends on professor to professor, I'd say. So yeah, one, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I guess uh, one of my professors specifically told me that the professors are instructed to curve like to like a B. Um, so. So. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll go over this a little bit again. So I came into UCLA, um, like I said, no engineering experience at all, like nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing. And I'm not exaggerating, it really is absolutely nothing. So please don't worry if you don't have any experience coming in. Um, but I was really interested in battery research and development and 
uh, renewable energy, still interested in renewable energy, maybe not so much the battery side. Uh, I'm more interested in battery applications rather than the development of batteries, just because I'm not really good at chemistry and you know the material science aspect. So I think that's better left to people that are uh, more knowledgeable with that. But I guess the reason why I was interested in that stuff is because I was really interested in working at Tesla because you know at the time Tesla was like super big, big rising company. You know it's still a very sought after company to work at, but at the time, I don't know why I was just like obsessed with it. Um, so I came to, I think it was Discover Engineering. I think it was a day after Bruin Day or something. I'm not really sure, but I remember asking a professor at one of the uh, electrical and I think it was just electrical engineering uh, seminars where you get to ask professor questions. I was asking about battery research and he said that that's more something that the material science and engineering major focuses on. So if you're more interested in that aspect and the actual like chemistry and materials stuff behind battery development, then I would say look into materials engineering. But if you're interested in renewable energy, you do what I did um, and take the technical breath, the technical breath area path where I did mine in energy and the environment. So I took classes in the mechanical engineering department and the oceanic, the atmospheric and oceanic sciences department to learn about climate change and learn about energy transfer and uh, energy applications in the environment. So one of the mechanical engineering classes is called energy in the environment. So you learn about uh, nuclear power plants, solar, battery storage, uh, geothermal, a whole bunch of other stuff. It is nuts, but it's really interesting. So if you have any more questions, um, just feel free to message me in the chat or you can add me on Facebook or something. It's just my name, Wesley Clark. Um, you feel free to message me if you have more specific questions about that because I, I don't want to take up all of the time on it. But which requirements did you get from AP slash IB credits? Well, I got, <laughs> um, I, let's see. I got rid of my Math 31 series, which I think because of Calc BC, um, I didn't get any physics covered because my high school only offered physics two and not like physics C or something. But there's also an American history requirement, I think, and an English requirement, right? I got those covered, but I don't know what classes specifically they cover. I think that was it. Oh, and chemistry. I think. I got Chem 20A covered by AP Chem. Yeah, so I guess it's like AP Chem, AP Lang, I think. And then Physics C gets you out of like one physics class. And then uh, Calc, I think Calc gets you out of uh, like two math classes or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I think it has to be BC and not AB. Yep. Yeah, I think AB only gets you out of the first math class. Yeah, mm -hmm. 31A. If you take if you if you take Calc AB and uh, get a four or five on that, you get Math thirty one A covered. But then you have to take Math thirty one B, and that's all about series or Taylor series specifically, I think. So I hope you took Calc BC. <laughs> yeah, another thing is like for some reason your AP credits count towards your unit cap, so it can actually help you get like a better enrollment if you took a bunch of AP classes, but it doesn't give you credit, which is kind of weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just how it works. Yeah, and also dual enrollment counts too. So um, if you like, uh, yeah, took a class at your local community college, then you can count towards, uh, towards your graduation. Yeah. Is it hard for freshmen and sophomores to get major specific courses before finishing their gen ed? I'm not gonna lie, the first pass can always be a bit stressful. I think particularly for the lower division courses uh, because everyone just has to take them. So for the math series and the physics series, it can be difficult to get the classes, but they normally offer multiple, very large size classes, multiple lectures. So under different professors and at multiple times. Um, and I think they generally try and 
schedule the courses throughout the year so that you have multiple opportunities to take it in case you didn't get it during the one specific quarter. Yeah, for uh, GEs also, um, normally like at other schools, you might take them like your first few years, but UCLA, they're more like GPA boosters for the engineers. Um, I know, I think, I think Brian and I were talking about it. We were like, yeah, we saved all our GEs for senior year. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. I made the mistake of taking most of my GEs during my first and second year. And uh, that made the quarters after much harder because I was taking like four upper divisions at the same time. So I would recommend, if you can, trying to keep your GEs later on in, in your academic career. Yeah, there's some funny GEs too. I think there's like an anime GE that comes around once a year. Mm -hmm. And Scan50, keep that in mind. Scan50 has been my favorite. And it, I think it's one of the top GEs. It's like all A's, um, really easy, really interesting. You have to read for it, but the readings are actually fun because they're stories. So, and plus I'm pretty sure that freshmen actually, uh, I think a lot of GEs are only open to freshmen during first and pass or first pass or something. I don't know, so. But how do the grade curves work? I'm not entirely sure. I know that I depend on the curve a lot. Yeah. A lot of times what they'll do is like, they'll just give you like whatever grade and then they won't curve it at all. And then at the very end, they'll just see like the overall grades and then like place into buckets. So it can feel like a bit of a black box because you don't really know like where you're going to get curved until the end sometimes. Um, but I think that's definitely on a case by case basis. Every professor has like a different policy. They're usually pretty good about going over it like in their syllabus uh, at the start of the quarter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you'll find it's not very common to have uh, professors that have a straight scale. So it, it really varies from class to class on how much needs to be curved or if it needs to be curved at all. So. Yeah, in, in college, like in like some classes, like a 30% out of 100 is actually a really good score. So <laughs> keep that in mind. Don't don't like feel bad about like a 30% out of 100. Mm -hmm. So I got a DM. Um, and it says, how approachable are professors to talk to and get extra help? I'd say they're pretty easy to talk to. I don't think I've met a professor that wasn't willing to talk to me or help me at all. Um, I think the professors actually enjoy when you come and ask them questions because they're excited that you, you're showing interest in learning more. Plus it's good to make connections. Next question. Okay. <laughs> Did you take physics, C, E, M, or mechanics? And do you get out of the class for each or out of each? I didn't take either of those. It's only mechanics. E and M doesn't give you anything. Um, okay, I guess next question. Uh, did you participate in a cluster? Did you get a four or five on the mechanics? You can get one A. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Marianne. Sure. Sorry, <laughs> we, don't, we don't really know about that. About that. <laughs> um, yeah, so the cluster question. I participated in a cluster for one quarter. Uh, it was really interesting, but I didn't continue on with the cluster just because there were other GEs that I wanted to take that weren't in the cluster and I would rather have those GEs cover my requirements. But I know a lot of people have taken clusters and they take it because they're really interested in that topic and they enjoy it. But I don't know much about them, to be honest. I had a friend that took it. I think her, like, her thought was that it's probably more work than like a regular GE, but it also lets you knock off a lot of requirements. The clusters can be a little bit difficult for engineering students because you have to take all three quarters of it. And it, if it conflicts with 
one of your required, you know, classes that you have to take, then, it, then you might not be able to finish the cluster. So um, I do know students who have done it, but it's pretty, it's not as common for engineering students to do clusters, I think, than maybe other majors do. All right, next question is, do you recommend living in the campus or outside? Um, I think, in my opinion, I think it's, it's really a good idea to at least get one year on campus. Um, I stayed on the Hill for both my first year and my second year. I think uh, there's something unique about the freshman dorm experience where, uh, you know, it's like all these people, uh, their first time living away from home. And it's really cool just like meeting the people on your floor, uh, being able to like play games, go out with them. Uh, hang out. So I, I definitely uh, really enjoyed my freshman dorm experience. Um, I stayed in like Denev, which is a plaza. So typically, I think the the thought is like plaza, since you, everyone has like their own bathroom, it's a little bit more quiet, a little bit more private, but my floor was pretty uh, lively. I met a lot of good friends there that I still talk to today. So yeah, uh, in my opinion, definitely go for a dorm for at least your first year to see how it's like. Uh, you may want to do another year. And if not, you can always like look for some off-campus housing. Um, I have actually never lived on campus, uh, which is not very common for people that are not transfers. So then the reason why I didn't is because uh, I was very picky <laughs> about the dorms and I think I don't know. I don't know why I didn't. I would recommend that you should because I, I wish I did. Admittedly, it made it harder to make friends. Um, I had to go to every single event at, that I could for any clubs I was part of um, just to make friends. And also the walk to the hill to get, you know, food because I had an off-campus meal plan. It can be a bit rough because it's very uphill. So I don't know. I would just recommend living on the on the hill if you can because it's a great experience. You know, like Brian said, great way to meet people, make friends. Um, yeah, don't do what I did. But I, I guess also a caveat to this is that I'm from South California. I've been to LA quite a number of times. I'm not from LA, but I was familiar with the area. So yeah, I definitely would recommend living on the hill, like your first or second year. Um, I've actually met some of my best friends um, just on my on my floor in my dorm. So, um, yeah. I got a couple of DM questions. So, how accessible are the professors in general, especially in lower division classes? And then there's another one I'll ask after. So, I'd say pretty accessible. I think, at least in my experience, my lower division professors tended to hold more office hours just because there were more students. And so they were trying to accommodate uh, any time conflicts that people had. And plus they they seem pretty open to letting you schedule office hours with them in case that you can't make it to their general ones. So I would say pretty accessible, yeah. Okay, I'll move on to the next one. Um, is the quarter system much tougher than the semester system as people make it out to be? I guess, I think it's hard for us to compare the quarter system in college to the semester system of other colleges and simply because we just don't have a semester system here. Um, I guess in comparison to high school, if your high school was on semester system, which I think most high schools, at least in California are, uh, it can be tougher in the sense that it's much faster paced sometimes, or at least that's what it feels like. But you also have to remember that you're going to be taking more classes just because you're on a quarter system. So I think each class has a little bit, it has less content than what you would take in a semester long class. So it's also, I think it's kind of nice in a way because it's easy to remember like, oh, there's only 10 weeks for every single class you're going to take. Um, so if you're also really struggling in a class, that means you only have to take it for 10 weeks instead of a whole semester. Okay, I'll move on to another DM. Is it worth taking the AP Physics 1 test if it doesn't give any credit? I think if you wanna take it for self-satisfaction, 
go ahead. Um, but if you have to pay full price for the test and if it's not going to cover anything, uh, I would, it also helps because you would still get credits in the sense that it could boost your standing when you come into UCLA. So like Brian had said earlier, um, it might give you an earlier uh, enrollment time. But at least when I took it, uh, I think it was just kind of required by my teacher in high school to take it. So I think it's a personal choice. And is it easy to get a parking permit? I don't really know. I don't think any of us drive, right? Um, no, I don't have a car here. I think what most people end up doing is if they live on the hill, they're not going to bring a car since uh, they're just, they can just walk everywhere. Um, and for a lot of people that live like in the surrounding apartments around campus, um, I think most people, if they bring a car, they usually walk to campus and don't get a parking permit, I think is most common. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, maybe Marianne, you know a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think it, it may be a little bit tough with parking permits. Um, that's what I've heard at least. Um, as a staff member, it's not an issue, but for students, I know it can be. Um, however, I think for fall quarter, um, it may be a little bit less congested because there may still be students who are not going to be coming to campus or, or doing virtual coursework. So it may be a different story this fall, but you should definitely contact the parking services just to make sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, Marianne, I was wondering, um, we got a question like very at the very beginning of the breakout session asking if we could give more information about fall quarter and what it'll look like. Yeah, um, we actually don't have that information even, we don't have it yet. Um, there is a um, website where you can go, let me put that in the chat. Um, that you can go to just they'll put all the updates of what's going on. Um, at that website. Um, I shared it, what, Marianne. Sorry? Oh, I shared the oh, you link. put it in there. Great, thank you. Yeah, Anicia put the, put the link into the website uh, or into the chat. Um, and anytime they have more information, they'll update that website. Thank you very much. So where can they find job placements report for last few years of EE and CSE graduates? Um, I don't know what information we have on that. Um, I know we do a senior exit survey. Um, so when students are getting ready to graduate, we ask them to tell us what they are, like where they're going, if they're going to graduate school or if they're, if they got a job and we do compile those statistics. Um, I don't know if that's like post it anywhere, um, I can look into that and see if I can find out. Um, but yeah, I don't think that that's posted anywhere. And for the quarter system, how often do international students travel back home? So I think it's generally during winter and summer break, right? Because I think that's when the dorms are closed. And I think that's, those are also our longer breaks. So I yeah, believe that's sense. correct. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, my, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, yeah. My roommate, uh, first year was an international student. Um, he would go home. Uh, he went home uh, winter quarter. Um, I think he stayed for spring quarter and Thanksgiving. Um, what he did was he just like went to Seattle, have some, had some fun with some of his other friends. Um, and yeah. Um, is it worth it to bring a bike? <laughs> I tried this. It is really hard to bike up the hills. Um, also, you can't bike on campus. You can only bike around campus unless you're, we have some bike lanes, but you can't like bike on the sidewalks and stuff because of pedestrians. Um, but it was difficult for me. I do know people that do bike to campus and then they put it in like the, the bike walker areas. But if you want to be biking around the campus, that might be a bit difficult because you would still need to walk uh, with your bike to 
buildings. And how is AP credit being transferred? Is it by talking to our counselors? So for that, um, just make sure that you have your AP credit um, sent to UCLA. And then through the admissions office, they will post your AP credit to your um, DARS, which is the degree audit system that we have. Um, and we go over, we're gonna go over all of that in orientation. So definitely if you can come to our orientation sessions in the summer, you should definitely do that. Um, Cause we go over AP credit, transfer credit, scheduling for fall quarter, we go through everything during orientation. So that's the best way to find all that out. Is there any sessions offered during the summer? If so, do you recommend taking it? There is summer, which. there are classes being offered this summer. Um, they're all online. Um, they're still online for summer. Um, and um, yeah, you could take um, a, a couple classes in the summer if you'd like to. Um, it just depends again on um, what AP credit you have and if you, you know, what, like if you wanna take a math class, which math class would you start in or if you wanna do a GE. Um, it's really up to you. We don't necessarily recommend that you take summer classes. Um, students are always like trying to get ahead and get ahead, but I kind of feel like enjoy your last summer before college. Um, but if you wanna take a summer class, you definitely can. Um, orientation is not gonna be in person for right now. What we know right now is it's gonna be virtual. Um, and unless we hear anything different, it's going to be online. Oh, orientations, um, there's a bunch of different sessions starting about the second week of July and extending all the way to like mid-September. So there are three-day sessions and you can choose any of the sessions you want to. Um, orientation, once you SIR, once you submit your, um, that you're intending to go to UCLA, you'll get um, all that information from the orientation program about how to sign up. Um, how do we sign up for classes during the summer? Um, there is a, anybody can sign up for summer classes. So you would just go to summer.ucla.edu and you can just sign up through that, that website. Thank you, she put the link there. Yeah, do we have uh, any more questions? When do students generally start moving in? I think there's like week zero. Um, it's like the week before week one um, of like fall quarter where students start moving in. Uh, I'm not good with uh, not good with dates, so I don't know when exactly that is. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's like late or mid to late September, generally, because we normally start at the very end of September or very beginning of October. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just posted a link to the academic calendar for next year. So that usually has like all the important dates. Yeah, of course, Charles. Did you guys all watch the uh, NCAA March Madness tournament? We don't speak of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, we made the that, final four, man. <laughs> I know. Oh, that game hurt. That was hard. Like right? Yeah. Yeah. That was crazy indeed. Uh huh. Yeah, I was, uh, I was on a call with other people on Zoom, and all of us were just speechless. It was like, yes, no. <laughs> yeah. It's like that, that Reddit, that subreddit, yes, 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 no, or yes, yes, no, or something. Um, <laughs> is each student assigned an advisor? Yes. 
-hmm. Yes, each student is assigned a faculty advisor um, and you're required to meet with your faculty advisor at least once a year. And then you have the academic counselors too, who are, um, I'm one of them and you come, you can get academic counseling in our office and you also have a faculty advisor. Faculty advisor is a great way to get a research opportunity. You wanna just drop in, just talk about the research um, and yeah. When can we start getting academic counseling? So that starts basically in the summer during orientation. So um, you can ask any questions you have during orientation and then, uh, then officially, I guess it starts in the fall when you start your fall quarter. specifically for planning our courses. Yeah, that's exactly what we do in orientation. We, we help you plan out your classes for the whole year. Do any of us have on-campus jobs? I do not. Um, I uh, help teach EC3 for a couple quarters. Um, so like for that, um, like if you get like, I think it's an A or A plus in Briggs uh, EC3 class, he'll email you and he'll be like, hey, do you wanna help me teach EC3? Um, there's also like a lot of opportunities that, you know, like the, um, like the dining services, they offer a lot of student jobs. Uh, the bookstores offer a lot of student jobs. Um, there's also like, uh, you could help teach like classes, um, you know, like EC3, the physics labs are also like, they love um, learning assistance. You could also try to get like funded research over the year. Um, yeah, there's like a lot of opportunities. So, yep, just, uh, yeah, just apply for them. <laughs> So I guess also a reminder that there is going to be a club fair later today from one to three o'clock on Gatherly. Uh, I will find the link for that um, and post it in there, but our clubs are going to be there. I, yeah, okay, all three of us are going to be there. Um, so you can always come by and ask more questions if you think of any in the meantime. Um, but I'm also going to drop IEEE Watts website and I'll, I'll find the link for Discover Engineering, the virtual fair right now too. Um, also feel free to add me on LinkedIn or Facebook. You know, I'm always happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Yeah, on that note, I will also plug IEEE's links. Um, so here's our link tree. Uh, if you click on it, it will contain like more links to like our major websites. So definitely recommend you to join our Discord server and our Facebook group, as well as sign up for our mailing list. And yeah, uh, same as Wesleyan, if you have any questions, feel free to hit me up either on Facebook or on Discord, send me a message. Happy to answer any questions you have either about you know, IEEE or just UCLA in general. But thank you guys for coming. Yep, same here. Um, if you wanna add me on like any social media platform, um, just like look up my name. Um, I'm I'm free to answer any questions you have or just chat about random stuff. Um, also, the HCAN Discord is in the chat if you, if you want to join. So, yeah. All right. And we look forward to seeing you guys during orientation. Yeah. Congrats again on getting into UCLA. Congratulations.